Hey, what's up? It's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com again, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. Now, a question that I often get is, what kind of things you can do to isolate your room better from the rest of the building or maybe from the second half of your room? What kind of techniques you can use to soundproof your studio? Maybe your dividing a single room into two because you want to share it with somebody else and you want to put up some sort of barrier so you can use both halves of the room separately or maybe you just want to make sure that you don't bother your family or the neighbors in the rest of the house maybe you've got a, a basement studio or an attic studio you've got a staircase kind of leading up or leading down uh, like an open staircase and you want to figure out if there's some something you can do to block sound from going down the staircase and into the rest of the house. Now, a quick disclaimer before I get into it, my expertise really is in acoustic treatment and not soundproofing, not isolation techniques. But I understand the basics well enough and I wanna give you three big mistakes that I see people making when they think about isolation and the noise reduction and soundproofing. Um, so three big mistakes you wanna avoid if you wanna make sure that your efforts that you put into all of this actually work. So the first mistake I see people making is that they confuse soundproofing with acoustic treatment, right? So noise reduction, noise isolation with treating the actual room. They're not the same thing. Soundproofing or noise reduction is all about making sure that sound doesn't exit the room so it doesn't bother your neighbors or family or whatever. And also that noise can't come into the room to bother you while you're working, right? And acoustic treatment is all about making the room itself sound good. So just because you have good soundproofing, good noise isolation from the rest of the building doesn't mean that the room itself sounds good. A simple example to imagine this is just a concrete bunker. You might have like a, a decoupled floating bunker, which is perfectly isolated from the outside world, but it still sounds like a bunker inside, right? So you've got excellent noise isolation in this case, but no acoustic treatment. So these are two different aspects of acoustics with completely different goals. And that also means that the tools we use to reach those goals are completely different. And that brings me to my second point or the second mistake that I see people making. And that is that the materials you use for soundproofing, for noise reduction, need to reflect sound, not absorb sound. Right? So the tools that we use in acoustic treatment usually are meant to absorb sound, but the tools that we use for isolation, they actually need to reflect sound. And the better they reflect sound, the higher the isolation is going to be. Because ultimately what we want to do is create a barrier for sound not to go through. And especially in lower frequencies, that is going to be quite difficult. So the more reflective a certain barrier is, the better it is at also reflecting low frequencies, which in turn basically means that the isolation is better. The noise reduction through that barrier is higher. So looking at some of the materials out there that people tend to jump to or to, tend to think about when trying to figure out what might work for isolation purposes. First up, heavy curtains, right? But a curtain is meant to absorb sound not reflect sound. So it's not actually the right tool for isolation techniques. It actually lets most of the sound pass through, especially lower frequencies. So it doesn't really work for our purposes where we're trying to isolate music, right? So uh, sound that works across the spectrum. A curtain might help a little bit with like higher frequencies with speech, but even there, just a tiny amount. It might, it might basically muffle really quiet voices, but that's about it. If you're trying to isolate the music from a whole band or from just music coming from your speakers, a curtain isn't going to do much. Same with a carpet, right? A carpet absorbs sound. It doesn't reflect sound. So it's not going to help with isolation. There's no point in putting down a, a carpet if you're trying to isolate yourself from the floor below. It just doesn't work. And the same with acoustic panels. 
or insulation material. The insulation material itself or the, the porous material in the, in the acoustic absorber panel is meant to, as the name suggests, absorb sound. So again, it's not the right tool for isolation purposes. So what we need instead is a solid surface that reflects sound as best as possible. And in order for that to work, especially at lower frequencies, we need mass, right? We need this thing to actually be a proper barrier against those huge wavelengths that you'll find in the lower frequencies that come in with a lot of energy, right? So basically what we need is a wall and the heavier, the better. And that brings me to my third mistake that I see people making. And that is that they overestimate how well a certain solution actually works that they're looking at, how much reduction in noise they might actually get from putting up that, that barrier. Let's have a quick look at this very simple spreadsheet calculator that calculates the transmission loss that you might get from a certain barrier assembly, a certain wall assembly, okay? And this is actually taken from this book right here, which is in German, unfortunately, but it's a very simple kind of idealized calculator that nicely illustrates what you might expect. So what I'm showing you here is the effect a single layer of drywall will have, right? So very simple gypsum board, which has a weight of roughly 1.2 pounds per foot squared. So that's about 5.8 kilograms per meter squared. And if I put this in this very simple calculator, it shows us how much loss in sound pressure level we can expect at different frequencies, right? Starting at 31.5 Hertz, up to the next octave of 63 Hertz, up to the next octave of 125 Hertz and so on. And all I want you to pay attention to is this one single black line, which shows us the effect of that single layer of gypsum board. And as we can see here, it actually has zero effect at 31.5 Hertz, right? So a single layer of gypsum board isn't gonna stop low frequencies, very low sub bass frequencies at all. But moving up to 63 hertz, we get a transmission loss, a reduction in sound pressure level through this barrier of maybe five to six dB. And then going up to 125 hertz, that rises by another six dB to about 12 dB in total. And in fact, we, we get this steady gradual increase of roughly five to six dB per octave. The thing to understand here is that a barrier won't have the same transmission loss across the spectrum. It actually starts off the weakest or the, the worst at lowest frequencies, and then it generally increases in its effectiveness as you go up in the frequency spectrum. That's something to just keep in mind. Whatever barrier you put up, it's always gonna be better at stopping sound at higher frequencies in comparison to lower frequencies. And if you want any effect at lower frequencies at all, you actually have to start with a pretty hefty wall. Ideally, you wanna put up two walls, in fact. And very roughly said, you could argue that you will get an increase in transmission loss, AKA how much sound goes through the wall or how, how large the reduction is, rather. You get an increase by about six dB with every doubling of mass. So starting with this single layer of gypsum board at 1.2 pounds per foot squared, if you double that to 2.4 pounds per foot squared, you'll go from 6 dB of re noise reduction at 63 Hertz up to about 12 dB at 63 Hertz. If you wanna double that again, if you wanna get 18 dB of noise reduction at 63 Hertz, you have to double that again. So you have to jump from 2.4 pounds per foot squared to 4.8 pounds per foot squared and so on and so forth. So as you can see, it actually becomes increasingly difficult to stop low frequencies. The higher your demand is basically, the, the more isolation you wanna get, right? And again, we're talking jumps of 6 dB here. Compare that to literally just turning down the volume of your system as you're working by 6 dB. 
So let me just play a quick sine tone at 63 hertz for you. I'm gonna reduce it by 6 dB just as a quick example. So you can hear what doubling the thickness of your wall will do in terms of improving the reduction of, of volume. Right, so that's all you're gonna get from doubling the mass of the, the barrier that you put up. And you can see just how much it takes to actually stop sound. But going back to our little diagram here, this actually only describes the sound reduction, the, the reduction in, in sound pressure level you'll get from the barrier itself. This isn't talking about the sound reduction you'll get in the room that the, the barrier is trying to protect. The reason is that sound loves to travel through the actual building material. So if noise is coming from another room, it'll actually enter the wall, go through the construction material, go around this one barrier that you've put up and come out of all the other walls that aren't covered by the barrier. So in practice, you won't actually get a reduction as predicted by this simple spreadsheet because sound can actually go around the barrier and still get into the room. That's what makes it even more difficult. And that's why ultimately, if you really want to get this right, you have to look at room and room constructions where every single surface has a barrier like this to protect it from sound transmitting, getting transmitted through it, right? So in, in practice, putting up a single barrier always has limited use. And that's really a bummer, uh, a bummer of a realization. Uh, because you can put in a lot of effort to put up a single very well-built structure, but its use is still going to be so-so. So unfortunately, proper isolation, proper noise reduction that works in a studio, even a home studio, is always expensive and time-consuming and very invasive to the room that you're trying to improve especially if you want to take it to that level where you can work at night, for example, without bothering your family or your neighbors. The truth is there is no cheap way to get proper soundproofing, functional noise reduction that works with full range music. It's just not possible. If you actually want it to work, you have to do it right. So if you're looking at soundproofing options right now, make sure you always remember those three mistakes. Okay, so first of all, soundproofing is not the same as acoustic treatment. You can't look at acoustic treatment tools for the job of soundproofing and noise reduction. And in order to distinguish between the two, you can always ask yourself, is this thing that I'm looking at reflecting or absorbing? If it's absorbing, then it's made for acoustic treatment and it's not right for your purposes. If it is reflective, the question is how much? And in order to get enough reflection, especially at low frequencies, you really need a lot of mass. And even then, make sure you're realistic about what you can expect to happen. The amount of reduction is always gonna be higher in the high frequencies and it's gonna drop off towards the low frequencies. And this is especially true if you don't have an option to put in a proper wall or you're just not willing to do it right now. If you're actually gonna put up a curtain as a barrier between two rooms, let's say, or to section off the staircase, just make sure you understand what you can expect to happen. It's just not going to work at low frequencies and even at high frequencies, it might just reduce it by a, a very small amount. Now, what I tend to recommend is when people come and ask me about what they can do to isolate the room better is to, if nothing else, making sure that the room is airtight, right? Because sound is gonna go through even the tiniest cracks and holes that you can't even see and completely ruin any chance of isolation. And this concerns especially doors and windows. If they don't close properly, if there are gaps, if the seal isn't right, that's going to let sound through like nothing else. So what you could do, for example, is play some white noise outside of the, the door or the window, and maybe just with one ear holding one ear shut and with the other ear, you just go along the seam of the door and the window to check where sound is coming through. And then it's those spots where you need to put in some work to make sure it seals airtight. And obviously that means looking at 
changing out the weather stripping or it means sealing up any edges or corners with caulk or silicone. By the way, you always want to make sure that it dries flexible, right? So the stuff needs to still have some flexibility once it's dried. Okay, so uh, if I've successfully brought you off of the idea of using a curtain, make sure that the room is airtight. If nothing else, that's gonna give you a useful improvement in terms of noise reduction. And by the way, if you're currently setting up a new room, one of the most tricky things to really grasp, to understand is where you need to place your setup, like which side in your room to face and where exactly your listening position needs to be. And this is especially the case if you're dealing with like a really odd shaped room that isn't just a perfect square. Because at that point, all these guidelines about just like facing the short side and maybe placing your listening position at 38% of the room's length, those obviously don't work. So what do you do in those scenarios? Well, exactly for these kind of rooms, I've developed a special listening test that will help you figure out where you need to place your listening position and which side in your room you really want to face. I call it the Base Hunter technique and you can download it for free at the link in the description. Because in the end, you don't get to pick where your listening position needs to be. The room is gonna dictate that for you and it's your job to find out where that actually is. In the end, it all comes down to standing waves or room modes and the particular pattern of room modes and standing ways that your room has. What you want to make sure is you sit in the spot where the balance between all those standing waves gives you the most even low end response. So again, if you're currently setting up a new studio, you're trying to figure out where to best place your listening position, which side to face, where to place your setup, make sure you download the guide to the base hunter technique in the description in order to figure out where the ideal listening position in your room actually is. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching. As always, I'll see you in the next video.